<clears throat> same publisher. What many of the big game companies decide to publish always fascinates me because you kind of associate certain types of games with certain types of publishers. You know, there are certain things that just kind of look like, yeah, that's a Sony published game. There are some things that just look like a Nintendo published one, a Microsoft, but not really Microsoft, but still. The point is there's a certain vibe each company usually gives off which makes it really weird when they get out of their comfort zone. Now to be fair, when a company publishes a game, that doesn't mean they're really doing much other than kind of paying for marketing, manufacturing, all that kind of stuff. Just because they're publishing the game doesn't really actually mean they made the game. You know, sometimes, you know, they have input on development and they, they help out with that, but other times, they're, they're just kind of there to help get the game out to the masses. So just because Sony published The Last of Us Part Two and Muppets Movie Adventures, I don't think these wires ever really crossed. But something I always find really fascinating is what Nintendo decides to publish. Because many of these are just the questions that never get answers. So yeah, we generally always associate Nintendo with the family-friendly, super colorful games. But uh, in terms of what they decide to publish, uh, it's really always up in the air. Sometimes it makes sense. It kind of aligns with uh, what they usually publish and develop themselves. And other times it feels like they're publishing things that they really never have on their platform. It's kind of there just to fill a void in their lineup. And then other times like it doesn't fill a void in the lineup. It's just, it's just fucking weird. So here's one thing that Nintendo always seems to publish that uh, it, it, it's not weird, it, it definitely tracks, but it, it's just strange because, like, there, there's no reason- I, I don't really understand why Nintendo always publishes Dragon Quest here in North America. Square Enix has shown time and time again that they're willing to publish Dragon Quest on platforms like the PlayStation consoles or Xbox. When it comes to Dragon Quest on Nintendo platforms, Switch, DS, 3DS, Nintendo's usually almost always publishing it. And we can always easily tell on the Nintendo Switch by looking at the spine. Boom, that right there, that's a Nintendo game. Uh, even though both of these games were on PS4. Dragon Quest Builders 2 launched simultaneously on Nintendo Switch and PS4. Yet Nintendo published the Switch version with Square Enix handling the PS4 version. Now, I believe if you're Square Enix, you're just kind of like, well, that's a sweet deal. We don't have to worry about this on Nintendo Switch. Nintendo will handle all of that. Maybe it's to ensure just a strong relationship between them and Square Enix. I mean, Nintendo pretty much publishes almost every single one of Square Enix's more traditional RPGs on Nintendo Switch. And they also kind of get like a timed exclusive deal with them, like with Octopath Traveler, Triangle Strategy, uh, Live Alive. All published by Nintendo, though they did all eventually go multi-platform. But then you have Octopath Traveler 2, which Nintendo didn't publish. That was published by Square Enix across the board, and it launched on PS4 and PS5 uh, day and date with Nintendo Switch. And didn't do as well. So yeah, that might actually be why Nintendo comes in and helps Square Enix publish some of these games on Nintendo Switch. Uh, you know, if they're doing the marketing, if they kind of get that uh, exclusivity window, uh, I, I feel like more people are actually going to be kind of looking at these games. And it feels like Nintendo's publishing them without really that much fear as to if they're going to sell that crazy well. I think they just kind of like having these really high quality RPGs uh, on their platform. Whereas if Square Enix is publishing them, I mean, like, they're, they're just always not gonna be satisfied with their sales. You see, like, any sales numbers go on about Square Enix games, they're almost always pissed off about them. But Dragon Quest has a certain legacy to it, you know? I think Nintendo likes having that on their platform because it's such a legendary franchise, and, and really keeping it on Nintendo, uh, it's probably just this really important feeling. I don't know why the hell they did these two. Yeah, Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3? and DC Superhero Girls Teen Power. These were both very strange ones. More so DC Superhero Girls. Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3. Uh, I just think it's weird that Nintendo kind of seeked this game out. So the Marvel Ultimate Alliance series was kind of just like this, whatever, like, like to me, it was always just kind of this, this series of, of games that just kind of happened during the sixth generation of game consoles. They were just Marvel games that happened during that era, you know? A lot of people had some decent memories with them, but they were never these, like, 
Oh my god. So to resurrect this franchise uh, just seemed a little strange. Uh, not only that, but uh, they got help from uh, Koei Tecmo and Team Ninja to develop the game. So this wasn't even like they were really getting the band back together to make one more Marvel Ultimate Alliance game. Like, no, th this was a completely new developer. They genuinely went out of their way to bring this series back. Strange, but whatever. And then with DC Superhero Girls Teen Power, uh, this is just strange because this is like... Even though this is a licensed game, this is a licensed, licensed game. Based on a cartoon show, uh, it's not like a bad game. Neither one of these are bad games for what they are. Uh, it's just... I find it weird that Nintendo went out of their way to publish these. Like, like they were like, well, if nobody else is gonna do it, we will. It's just strange. I, I kind of feel like somebody would have published DC Superhero Girls. I mean, like, it's a WB property. It's Warner Brothers. Why wouldn't Warner Brothers just publish this? It doesn't make any sense. And then for a bit on Nintendo Switch, it felt like Nintendo was trying to fill the void of the Wii series of games. Uh, so thus they uh, were publishing stuff like Fitness Boxing and Go Vacation by Namco here. Once again, these aren't bad games, but they aren't Nintendo games. I think it's really strange Nintendo published Go Vacation. Uh, this was back in 2018, really early on in the Switch's life. And uh, the, the entire point of publishing this, I don't know. I guess it kind of gives the Switch a bit of like a Wii Sports Resort style game, but... I mean, like, yeah, this is similar to Wii Sports Resort, but that game and this game are two completely different beasts. They may have similar themings, but they ain't the same. I guess this was just kind of to test the waters, just see if consumers would respond well to these more casual type games. Maybe that's why Nintendo published them. I, I don't know. But see, that's just talking about the Nintendo Switch, where it feels like Nintendo's really gone out of their way to publish more titles throughout each and every year. Uh, but they've been doing stuff like this throughout their entire life as a video game publisher. Take, for example, why? Disney's Magical Mirror starring Mickey Mouse. So when the GameCube was first unveiled, uh, they they showed like this sizzle reel of games coming to the GameCube. One of them being the Mickey Mouse game. Holy shit! Then this game came out, and uh, I believe like the IGN review is like uh, around the four out of ten range, which is strange because like not only is this published by Nintendo, it's developed by Capcom. Now, if you aren't aware, Capcom has done a ton of, like, really high-quality Disney games. Uh, specifically, some starring Mickey Mouse, like Disney's Magical Quest. You know, Magical Quest? Magical Mirror? This is sure to be just a bullshit f***ing game. I, this game is stupid. Yeah, this is literally a point-and-click game for three-year-olds with no dialogue. Like, this is just a completely brain-dead and just devoid of any fun experience. It, it is crazy that uh, not only did Nintendo publish this, but Capcom developed it. But you know what are some games that are even crazier than Nintendo published? <laughs> what? Okay, so what's weird about this? Mario and Sonic 2014 and Mario and Sonic 2016. Uh, well, uh, I think it's just kind of strange because Nintendo doesn't publish these games normally. Sega does. I think that's still kind of weird in general. It's very strange when Nintendo does kind of these uh, crossover uh, kind of collaboration titles, uh, but they don't publish it. You know, you look at something like Mario plus Rabbids, Ubisoft handles the publishing on that. Uh, even stuff like the Warriors titles, uh, like Hyrule Warriors, Fire Emblem Warriors, uh, outside of North America and Europe, uh, Koei Tecmo handles the publishing of those games. Uh, and the same goes for the Mario and Sonic series. Uh, on the Wii and Nintendo Switch, Sega publishes those games. So that just kind of makes me question, why on the Wii U did Nintendo take over publishing duties? Was it just because, like, since the Wii U was just not doing too hot, like Nintendo wanted to step in to publish these. You know, I'm just kind of thinking out loud right now, but maybe it's like a move for investors to just kind of show uh, a bigger, greater lineup of games uh, that they have coming out soon uh, on their on their forecast for that quarter. Because back during like the Wii era and during the Nintendo Switch era, 
Like, they, they don't need to fill the gaps with the Mario and Sonic titles. But maybe during the Wii U era, they were like, ah, oh, God, okay, fine, yeah, this is a big game that's coming up soon. I don't know, but either way you slice it, I think it's a little strange that, like, throughout the entire Mario and Sonic series, Sega publishes these games outside of these two instances. Now, I think it's pretty well known that Nintendo published GoldenEye 007 on the Nintendo 64. Uh, you know, that, that's kind of one of the big reasons why it was so hard to re-release this game for the longest time, because Nintendo published the game, Rare developed it, who's now owned by Microsoft, and it's a movie licensed game, so this thing is disgusting. But at the time, uh, Nintendo not only published GoldenEye 007, they were publishing any and all James Bond video games. One more. Yeah, Nintendo owned the rights to James Bond games, uh, which is really, really weird that, that they just owned, like, just they, they just had the James Bond license during this era, and they only made two games. Especially when GoldenEye 007 was as, like, crazy big as it was. They only, did, like, they only really did this one and James Bond 007 on Game Boy. Yeah, this game is pretty much worthless to play these days. It's just like a weird top-down adventure game. Uh, but, you know, for a game like this, uh, there's only so much patience I have, and I'm not really willing to waste a lot of my time trying to figure out James Bond 007 on Game Boy. But they were planning a GoldenEye 007 game for Virtual Boy as well. It's obvious Nintendo had more plans when it came to the James Bond license, but that license quickly went to EA, uh, who had it for a very long time, and then Activision, uh, and now uh, it's just, it's just kind of whatever. I think IO Interactive is making a James Bond game. They were able to re-release GoldenEye 007. James Bond and gaming is finally back. But let's not forget the era where Nintendo owned the license and barely did a goddamn thing with it. Speaking of that Game Boy era, this was when Nintendo was pulling some funny shenanigans. Yeah, they published all of these games. Uh, actually, no. They didn't publish Bionic Commando Elite Forces. They developed it. And Capcom published it. Why? Yeah, this is really strange. You know, we have, uh, Beauty and the Beast, a board game adventure, and then, uh, The Little Mermaid 2, the direct-to-video sequel. And it's not even a game based on it. Like, oh, man, you know, like, th let's, let's play through li The Little Mermaid 2. Now, this is a goddamn pinball game. Game based on, uh, the movie Quest for Camelot. And then we have Bugs Bunny, uh, Crazy Castle 3. Uh, they didn't publish the first two. This one, they had to. And then Crystalis, which is an SNK game, uh, and Nintendo not only published it, but they also developed this port as well. So why was Nintendo publishing so much junk like this uh, on Game Boy and Game Boy Color at the time? Uh, and, you know, not all of this is junk. You know, Bionic Commando, Elite Forces, Crystalis, these, you know, these are good. Uh, but... I assume it just has to do with, you know, kind of the, the market at the time. You know, the Game Boy was big with kids, obviously. So, uh, yeah, why not ensure that you get stuff like, you know, Disney-based games like this on here, games based on children's animated movies. You know, hey, why the hell not? Do whatever the hell you want, Nintendo. I don't, I don't care. But hey, I like to act big for the camera. I do actually kind of care, specifically about Samurai Warriors 3, on the Wii, yes, this was published by Nintendo. Not only published by them, they actually developed a bit of this game. Now, it did also come to PS3 and PSP, but that was later and only in Japan. The Wii version of Samurai Warriors 3 uh, was kind of considered a big deal. I think Nintendo wanted to really push this game uh, just to kind of give the Wii uh, a bit of a hardcore title. Uh, even though the Warrior series at this point uh, wasn't really anything special. Uh, you know, it always had its fans, but I think most people kind of looked at these games as uh, super repetitive, uh, not super deep hack and slashes, uh, you know, which they kind of are. But hey, give the Wii kind of a more core, hardcore action game. Why the hell not? And uh, just to kind of seal the deal, uh, there is a Nintendo exclusive mode in the game featuring... Takamaru! Holy shit, you must be saying. What the hell is that? Takamaru is like this Nintendo character that keeps appearing in things, even though his game barely ever left Japan. The mysterious Murasame Castle. It was only in Japan, 
uh, until this one time when they re-released it on the 3DS Virtual Console. And uh, now the 3DS Virtual Console is gone, so, you know, good fucking luck. But that character and game inspired the minigame in Nintendo Land, Takamaru's Ninja Castle. He appears as an assist trophy in Smash Brothers. Uh, he is a big part of Nintendo's history. Uh, not enough to really get any game after, uh, you know, the one, but big enough to be a mode in Samurai Warriors 3, Murasame Castle Mode. It's almost like a 3D reinterpretation of that original game in Samurai Warriors 3, and uh, Takamaru appears in there, and you can also unlock him as a playable character, which is really cool. I don't know how well that translated over to Wii audiences when this released in 2010 here in North America, but it's still kind of a cool thing that happened. You know, it also was a cool thing that happened, the death of my innocence. And Nintendo was definitely more open to publishing M-rated games on the Wii U. Uh, that was where we got them publishing Ninja Gaiden 3, Razor's Edge, and uh, of course, Bayonetta 1, 2, and Devil's Third. I think most people know Bayonetta at this point, you know, how Nintendo mainly publishes the series now. Uh, you know, the series wouldn't be alive to this day if it weren't for Nintendo. There was never gonna be a Bayonetta 2 unless Nintendo stepped in and funded that game's development, published it. You know, Nintendo's the only one that could have published Bayonetta 2 and 3 and Bayonetta Origins. But that doesn't mean Nintendo owns the series, not at all. It's still owned by Sega here, uh, Nintendo just publishes the game, which is definitely interesting. It feels like Sega just owns the IP, but they don't want anything to do with it. Uh, they, they just, they go like, you know what, Nintendo, if you want to publish it, be our goddamn guest. And I think Nintendo wanted to do kind of a similar thing with Devil's Third, but it just, it didn't work out nearly as well. This was originally a THQ game, uh, the years before, and THQ went under, and then this game was just kind of in limbo. Uh, but then Nintendo brought it back. They were like, you know what? We'll publish this game. We'll help you finish it up. And God damn it, it worked out. But one of the coolest things I think Nintendo published uh, during the Wii U era that wasn't their own uh, was Shovel Knight, but only in Japan. Yeah, I think that was really cool of Nintendo to do, to localize Shovel Knight in Japan uh, and, uh, you know, help them release it over there because this was kind of like the big deal on Wii U, you know, Shovel Knight's kind of the face of independent games, uh, and uh, it started on Wii U and 3DS back, uh, back when it first launched. So for Nintendo to embrace that and kind of proudly release it as one of their own games in Japan, I think was really cool. Uh, Nintendo also was publishing the Fatal Frame series around that time. Uh, recently, it's obvious that Koei Tecmo, who owns the Fatal Frame series, has taken over, you know, publishing for the series and, and is going multi-platform with it all. And uh, Fatal Frame originally started as a multi-platform game, but uh, during the Wii era, like, Nintendo published the games and, and helped develop them and uh, they, they were Nintendo exclusive for a bit there, which I think is weird as hell. I don't get that. I don't understand why Nintendo like kept doing that. Cause it's just like, they, they weren't really benefiting much from that. I guess they just saw the void of horror titles on their platform and Fatal Frame was a series that might've needed that extra help when it came to publishing. So, Okay, does the same logic apply to Hamtaro? Yeah, Nintendo published like a ton of Hamtaro games for a while there. I don't understand. I just remember a lot of Hamtaro around this era, like the early 2000s. I remember like seeing this thing uh, everywhere and uh, definitely seeing a lot of video games advertised uh, surrounding this character. Uh, so much so that I almost kind of viewed this as kind of like this, this pseudo like, Kirby-like character in Nintendo's lineup. I know that sounds really strange, but that, that's just how I kind of thought of it back in the day. Uh, because uh, I remember seeing like promos for like Kirby right back at you. So you had the Kirby games and the Kirby show, and there was Hamtaro games and the Hamtaro show. So I kind of just, I, I kind of viewed this as like, oh, it's just another one of those, one of those Nintendo games, eh? It's just weird as hell. Uh, but uh, I think what is weirder is, uh, Ah, uh, yep, they published Top Gear Rally on the Game Boy Advance. Fills a void, don't it? Now, even though all of these games published by Nintendo are, are definitely a bit strange, uh, I, I definitely find it the most interesting when Nintendo develops a game 
but it doesn't get published by them. That always confuses me, uh, but it happens. Uh, it doesn't happen frequently, but it does happen enough, you know, Ridge Racer DS and also Ridge Racer 64. Now this is a Namco property, but 64 and DS were developed by Nintendo. Uh, not published by them, but hey, somebody had to develop the game. Uh, to be fair, 64 was published by Nintendo as well, uh, but DS here, published by Namco. We also have Project Cross Zone. Now, this was like a big deal, at least when it was being teased. Uh, you know, it was just being teased as like, oh, Sega, Capcom, and Namco are all coming together for a collaboration project. And it turned out to be a turn-based strategy game. Oh boy. Nah, seriously though, this was pretty cool. Uh, it's not everybody's cup of tea, but it is definitely a truly one-of-a-kind game. It's only a two-of-a-kind game since there was a sequel, both developed by Monolith Soft. Now, this game was published by Namco, who originally owned Monolith Soft, but when these games came out, Monolith Soft was a Nintendo company. Nintendo bought Monolith Soft. Monolith Soft works for Nintendo. So, it, you know, that does mean this is a Nintendo-developed game, and it's published by Namco, which this doesn't feel like super weird. Uh, Project Cross Zone 2 does incorporate Nintendo characters uh, in the form of uh, Fire Emblem and uh, I believe Xenoblade characters appear in that game, but it definitely doesn't feel out of place because Monolith Soft already developed a similar game to this like years before, pretty much a precursor to this called Namco Cross Capcom, uh, Japanese only tactical role-playing game, but still definitely a funky little critter when you get down to it. But I think the funkiest critter is Snoopy Concert. Definitely a bit weird to have a Japanese exclusive Peanuts game. This only released in Japan on the Super Famicom. Uh, you know, because hey, Snoopy and Peanuts, that's popular worldwide, but now nah, this, this only stayed in Japan and it was developed by Mitsu Fudasan but Nintendo developed it. I don't understand why they felt the need to develop it, uh, because when you look at the gameplay, a f***ing cat could develop that. But yeah, I just kind of wanted to recap some of the stranger games Nintendo's published in the past, and that's just scratching the surface. That's just a lot of them that I could think of at this moment, some of the ones that I had on my shelf. And uh, that's not even counting others I have on my shelf. I know they published Mega Man 6 in North America, Japanese exclusive Just Dance games, uh, called Just Dance Wii, and of course, NBA Courtside 2002. But I kinda wanna know what you think are some of the strangest games Nintendo's published, or just games in general from companies that you think are just kind of these weird things that they publish, games that you wouldn't expect to have seen them publish. Take this as a challenge. I don't know if you can outdo Sony publishing Muppets Movie Adventures or Sony publishing Looney Tunes Galactic Sports or Nintendo publishing Mario and Sonic.